Okay, great. I think we are all good to go. Um, so like I said, I'll be moderating today. I'll be um, monitoring the chat as well. So please feel free to send your um, questions in there um, you know, as they come up and, um, and we'll make sure those get answered. And then, like I said, if you have any any issues with anything, you can also let me know, um, and we'll we'll do our best to resolve that as well. So it's um, my pleasure to introduce you all to Valerie Slater, um, our uh, speaker for this session. Um, Ms. Slater is a juvenile justice attorney. She's also the executive director of the Rise for Youth organization. Um, that organization advocates for the rights of youth and families facing justice system involvement um, or engaged with other systems charged with um, the care of the Commonwealth's um, youth. She earned her JD from the University of Richmond School of Law and her bachelor's from Colorado State University. She's a fierce, fierce advocate for children and brings, her, brings to her work an unwavering commitment to strengthening youth and communities to lead the efforts to realize their visions for change. She is an awesome speaker. I've heard her before, so I can attest to that. Um, and we'll let her, let her take it away from here. Thanks, Valerie. Thank you so very much, Jessica. I am honored to be here with you all today. Um, my name, of course, is Valerie Slater, and I am really excited about this conversation that we're going to have today, talking about how can we address the school to prison pipeline and use a trauma-informed approach. I am going to queue up my presentation. Uh, give me just two seconds here to get it right before I share it. I don't want to jump in the middle. I want to start at the very beginning. But yeah. I am super excited to be here with you all today, and I am excited that this conversation is focusing on the, need, on the needs of children with disabilities because too often they can fall through the cracks, and that's never okay. Um, we have all of these conversations about uh, the needs of children, and we just need to be sure that we are talking about the needs of every child, that we aren't leaving anyone out. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm super excited to be here with you all today. And yeah, addressing trauma to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. Um, you've already heard who we are, but we are absolutely committed to making sure that communities are at the forefront of the conversations that we're having about the changes that we need to see to make sure that their young folks are respected, that young folks have the opportunity to dream, and that they are indeed provided with everything they need to be successful. And so just kind of going over what I'm hoping that we can uh, accomplish today. Um, I already had an introduction. We're going to do a little bit of true or false, test your knowledge about the justice system and about um, the school to prison pipeline. And then we're going to delve into the work, right? We're going to talk about what exactly is a school to prison pipeline. We're going to talk about trauma and adverse childhood experiences. And then we're going to talk about what those two have, what is the impact on the school to prison pipeline and then where do we go from here? Once we kind of lay all of that out, because I'm gonna go ahead and tell you up front, some of the information I'm gonna share is kind of disparaging, right? But we can do something about it. So where do we go from here and how do we actually take a trauma-informed approach? And then finally, you know, what can you do beyond the school building? Because yeah, I'm gonna talk a lot about what can happen inside the building, but there are things that we can do as advocates, as parents, as those concerned about the treatment of children with disabilities inside the school building, there's something we can do outside. We can, and, and we'll get to that as well. So let's jump in, true or false? And um, I, I guess if you believe something is true, raise your hand. Gosh, you know, I, I've only done this in person thus far, so this is going to be interesting to see. Uh, maybe drop in the chat, true or false, what you think. Um, and yeah, we'll just do it that way. So Virginia spends approximately $100,000 to incarcerate one youth for a year in a juvenile correctional facility. Is that true or false? that it's approximately $100,000 for a child to be incarcerated for a year in a youth prison here in Virginia. 
And yeah, go ahead and okay. I've got one false. Yeah. I've got one true. I've, I've got chat open. I want to see true, maybe more. Okay. Anyone else want to answer? I was thinking more also. Okay. You know what? It's false. According to the 2020 uh, DJJ Data Resource Co Guide, we spent more than twice that, almost uh, one and a half times more than that. We spent $242,000 uh, a year to incarcerate one child in a juvenile correctional center here in Virginia. So the annual average per student spending in DJJ is greater than or equal to the state annual average per student spending on kids that are attending um, K through 12 in the general population. Is that true or false? Does DJJ spend as much or more than the state does for kids who are not incarcerated? What do y'all think? Okay. More, true, okay, okay. Yeah, it's true. DJJ spends an average of 46,000 per student, whereas the state spends an average of 12,000 per student. I, I, I want you all to just kind of allow these statistics to sink in, right? That we spend over $242,000 a year to incarcerate a child, that the state spends 46,000 on education for an incarcerated youth and only 12,000 for a youth who is not incarcerated. So just kind of keep this information in your head as we talk. Let's see here. Exclusionary discipline is an effective tool that allows students to reset and then return to their educational setting better able to access learning. Is that true or false? Thank you for the false, false, you're good. Oh, I'm so glad to see all of those false. Yes, you're right, that is false, that is false. I have heard that before. That is actually, I'm quoting someone when I wrote that. So exclusionary discipline, it places students at a greater risk of experiencing a wide range of co correlated educational, economic and social problems including avoiding school, go figure, you put me out of school, I miss time, I'm now behind my peers, now I don't wanna go back. Increased likelihood of dropping out, I don't wanna go back because I'm behind all of my peers, might as well never go again. And involvement with the juvenile justice system, when kids aren't where they should be, which is in school, what are they doing? They're getting into things that more than likely they shouldn't be getting into. And so that of course can lead to their involvement in the justice system. So children who have experienced trauma may exhibit responses that resemble misbehavior in school. Is that true or false? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's right, yeah. Trauma causes the prioritization of survival and it can manifest as hypervigilance hyper attuned, you know, always being in fight or flight. That's a, a, a more um, everyday way to say that. Disassociation or emotionally shutting down um, when an experience or experiences are too much to process or deal with. So that kid who's just completely checked out in school, you know, what's behind that perhaps. Um, and then regular exposure to hostility increases the likelihood of children responding to real or perceived danger with violence, right? Um, if a kid is living in fight or flight and that fight or flight uh, happens to even appear to have shown up in a school setting, how that child reacts, it can very, very oftentimes be with a violent behavior that may not be, um, it, it may not be aligned with the level of, of the situation but if that's what a child knows, then that's how that child is potentially going to react. And then finally, racism is trauma. Is that true or false? Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Racial trauma or race-based traumatic stress. It refers to the mental and emotional injury caused by encounters with racial bias and ethnic discrimination, racism, and hate. Hate crimes. So, yeah. So experiencing this kind of discrimination, um, prolonged exposure can lead to symptoms like those experienced with individuals um, that have post-traumatic stress disorder. So youth involved in the justice system have more extensive trauma histories than youth who are not involved with the justice system, true or false. That's true. So the U.S. Attorney General's Task Force on Child Exposure to Violence, they concluded that childhood trauma is associated with involvement in the justice system. So if indeed there's a direct correlation, we can then uh, extrapolate from that that indeed that is true. And then a profile of committed youth, an average of 64% that had been uh, had been a victim of a physical assault, 15 bullied, and 13% have been victims of sexual assault. So when we look at that and recognize that these are kids who are incarcerated and are not in school, they are not at home, they are not in environments that are treating them like children and allowing them to heal from their traumas, I hope that that gives all of us pause and we want to reflect on how we are, number one, going to keep kids in school. Number two, we're going to address whatever they're dealing with rather than the, sim- the symptom that we see, which may be misbehavior. And when we have added the fact that this is a child who also has a disability, that we are adding even more grace because we cannot anticipate that a child with a disability may have all of the tools necessary to it, to, to address whatever they're dealing with in a way that we might deem appropriate. And those are things that we will have to teach and we've got to be willing to take on that task and do what's right for all of our kids. Um, And so there was a study that was done in 2010 and everything that I have shared already, it is consistent with what research continues to show. And I'm sure that that's not It's not news to anyone, right? You're not surprised to learn that when children have been exposed to trauma, that it can then uh, lead to their involvement with the justice system. We're not we're not surprised. It's not news to us that experiencing trauma and then being involved with the justice system that that is consistent across all studies that have been done. But let's talk about the school to prison pipeline now because. If we understand that kids who have experienced trauma can then find themselves in trouble and engage in the school to prison pipeline, then that's going to that's going to necess- necessitate that we kind of back it all the way up, right? So we'll start with defining the school to prison pipeline. So it's disciplinary policies, procedures, and practices that push youth directly into the justice system for behavior that could have been handled at the school system level. It's the increased likelihood of schools pushing kids out, which then increases dropout rates and then increases the rate of justice system involvement. But it is also the disproportionate over the or the over incorrect categorization of certain students for special education services. And then that results and further targeting certain students, right? So if we are pushing kids directly into the system, we just didn't even pass go, didn't give them a chance. Or we're using exclusionary discipline that's pushing kids out, which in turn increases the likelihood that they'll drop out or that they'll be involved in the system. But also when we overuse or incorrectly use uh, special education as a catch-all for those kids that, oh, you know what, they're constantly in trouble or we want to group them because, you know, we need to categorize them in such a way that we can 
exclude them and, and we're not counting them as far as testing is concerned or their behaviors, we can uh, categorize it in such a way that, you know, either way we, we deal that deck. It's pushing kids into, category, into categories that are causing them to eventually end up in the school to prison pipeline, especially when it's incorrect categorization under the special education heading. So where did it come from? Where did this school to prison pipeline come from? Well, it came from the rise of what was uh, deemed or what folks thought was gonna be this super predator, right? So, I mean, literally in the late 90s, someone wrote, <laughs> this Mr. Bennett wrote, here's what we believe. America is now home to thickening ranks of juvenile super predators, radically impulsive, brutally remorseless youngsters, including ever more pre-teenage boys who murder, assault, rape, rob, burglarize, deal deadly drugs, join gun-toting gangs, and create communal disorder. <laughs> they do not fear the stigma of arrest. Isn't that something? Who thinks of children that way? Why would you want to begin thinking of children this way? And with this super predator narrative came an increase of uh, police in school. And, you know, and we're not going to go down into that rabbit hole today. But nevertheless, when you allow for children to be categorized in this way, it becomes a lot easier to push them out of school when you call them a super predator, when you view them as all of these negative connotations as listed here. So what, let's talk about exclusionary discipline and its effect on the school to prison pipeline. So in 2019, the United States Commission on Civil Rights, they issued a report you know, they investigated uh, school discipline practices and policies that impact students of color with disability and to see whether or not there was a connection between the two. What are the discipline school, uh, the school discipline practices and policies and does it indeed impact uh, students of color with disabilities and, the, and, and correlate with their being pushed into the school to prison pipeline? So by majority, the commission approved these key findings that students of color as a whole and by individual racial groups do not engage in more disciplinal, disciplinable behavior than their white counterparts. And since the Federal Department of Education began collecting this data on exclusion and expulsion, on suspension and expulsion, that data began uh, being collected in 98, 99 school year. And there has been a consistent consistent pattern of pushing out black students with disabilities at higher rates than their portion of the population of students with disabilities. And then when you look at black, Latinx, and Native American students collectively, they receive substantially more school discipline and harsher and longer punishment than their white peers for like offenses. So we've got a problem here, right? There is absolutely no way to uh, work around that to, to try to chalk it up to other things. If indeed students of color don't commit more disciplinable offenses and they are unfortunately at the disability um, uh, classification and they are receiving more uh, harsh discipline uh, sanctions, they're being pushed out, they're being uh, suspended and expelled at higher rates, we've got a problem. And then students with disabilities are approximately twice as likely to be suspended throughout every grade, grade level compared to students without. And the uneven application of disciplinary policies, it's again, disproportionately in low income and urban communities. And then here's one, right? The majority of out of school suspensions are for nonviolent behaviors. So we're not even putting kids out of school because they are harming other students. It's nonviolent behavior. So, and we already know that when you push kids out, you are going to increase the likelihood that they're going to engage in criminal behavior. Uh, they're going to have lower academic 
performance in school. So if we know that pushing kids out of school is not effective, then this next one is really important, right? Alternative disciplinary methods can be more effective than exclusion to address many forms of school behavior. So we're using something ineffective and all it's really accomplishing is pushing kids further into the system. And so what does that look like specifically here in Virginia? If black youth only make up 21% of uh, the young folks who are 15 to 17 years old in Virginia, why then are they 57% of the young people who are suspended? and 49% who are referred to juvenile court by school authorities, and then 42% who are reported to juvenile intake officers, and 54% who are detained in local jails, and 72%, that number has gone down slightly, now it is 68% of young people who are in the custody of DJJ. I told you I was gonna give you some disparaging uh, information here at the beginning, but it's important to drive the point home, right? We've got to recognize fully the extent and, and, and the weight of the problem before we began to attempt to address it. So nationally, at least 73% of youth with emotional disabilities who drop out of school are arrested within five years of leaving school. Black students with disabilities are 19% of all students with disabilities, but are represented at 50% of students with disabilities in correctional facilities. This study by the Council of State Government, uh, they found that being suspended or expelled made a student nearly three times more likely to have contact with the justice system. And that is after controlling for demographics and uh, all of the characteristics like race and all of those things. So I, I just want, I, I hope that all of this is sinking in. I hope that we have got to begin addressing the student behaviors in a way that stops sending our children with disabilities to prison. We've got to stop sending our students of color with disabilities to prison. Juvenile justice systems and adult prison populations suggest a strong relationship between disciplinary po uh, policies and the school to prison pipeline because 70% of incarcerated individuals have not completed high school and 75% of those under the age of 18 that are in adult prison haven't even completed the 10th grade. That's 75%. And then 70% of youth with disabilities have been identified as having a learning disability and 33% have a reading level below the fourth grade. So even though the overall number of committed youth is going down, youth of color are still disproportionately uh, confined in juvenile facilities, and they end up uh, consistently with harsher sentences than their uh, white peers, and they're longer. So here's something that, that, that I just want you all to consider this statement. As of 2001, one of every three black boys born in that year can expect to go to prison in his or her, in his lifetime as could one of every six Latin youth compared to one of every 17 white boys. This picture up in the corner, public education, the prison industrial complex. Yeah, one has no funds and the other is overfunded, right? And is welcoming our young people. And we have got to do something about that. So now let's talk about trauma and adverse childhood experiences. So let's define trauma. So it's an event or a series of events or a set of circumstances that's experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. And it has lasting adverse effects on that individual's functioning mentally, physically, socially, emotionally, or spiritually, right? 
Okay, so that's what trauma is. It's when something is happened to you. It's when you are living in a set of circumstances, like perhaps poverty, like perhaps um, a, a community that is not as healthy as it should be to support a child. It can be uh, a child taking on more responsibility as a child than they, than they should, meaning a child is now all of a sudden a breadwinner or uh, the caretaker, the, the exclusive caretaker for perhaps younger siblings or maybe even their um, parents, if indeed there are circumstances under which that parent is in need of the support of someone and no one from the outside is providing those supports. So now all of a sudden it's a child who has, ex who has assumed the responsibilities that should be the parent. Trauma, that's trauma. So what can that be? Abuse, whether it's physical, sexual, or emotional, neglect, uh, other traumatic events in the home, bullying, cyberbullying, peer relational aggression, you know, in a relationship where you're being uh, coerced into doing things perhaps that you don't want to do, you're being threatened. Um, other peer victimization. It doesn't have to be that you're in a relationship with this person, just that you, you, you're, you're in school with them or you're in community with them and you're being victimized. Uh, street crime or unsafe neighborhoods, sexual assault. Uh, historical trauma, um, and, and that leads directly into ro racism, homophobia, transphobia, sexism, ableism, uh, religious persecution, and microaggressions. Uh, microaggressions, you know, that can be uh, uh, touching hair, right? Um, asking someone, is it all right if I touch your hair? Because it's so different. Uh, than mine. Where are you really from? Where is that accent from? Oh, and, and you, you're attempting to answer that you're from the United States and then someone continuing to uh, press for a different heritage uh, answer or response from you. Um, or macroaggression, just blatant, uh, bigoted statements, right? So research has also shown that entire Black communities suffer trauma after a police shooting. And I would take it a step further and say that entire communities suffer trauma after any shooting. And unfortunately, there is um, there are too many instances where trauma is the cause, but a response is is not it's it's not taken to an account taking into an account that a young person perhaps is experiencing and dealing with trauma and, and, and they're punished in ways that are blaming the child and, and all that child is able to internalize is that I'm not receiving the supports that I need to deal with the issues that I'm facing. And race-based trauma, uh, that traumatic stress, that can come from witnessing racism, experiencing it, uh, discrimination or persistent prejudices, whether they are implicit or explicit, but it can have a profound impact on the mental health of individuals. So in recent years, inherited trauma has begun to be a commonly recognized, uh, it's begun to be commonly recognized. So uh, inherited trauma that's transmitted along and across generations and within communities that have suffered major assaults on their culture and well-being. And so I, immediately coming to mind for me is Native Americans, right? Um, and you know, without going down into that rabbit hole, but just to give an example of what that uh, historic trauma can look like. So when students are shouldering the accumulation of inherited racial trauma and then exposure to police violence, race, racist rhetoric from political leaders and from any other, uh, from any other source, right? but then their own firsthand experiences with discrimination, we have got to recognize the effect of racial trauma in order to restore equity and well-being in our young people. Uh, common traumatic stress reactions, they are reflecting racial trauma that include and include increased vigilance and suspicion, increased sensitivity to threat, a sense of uh, foreshortened future, 
um, maladaptive responses to stress, such as aggression. And it's important and likely that students are aware of current events, but um, these are things that can be triggering for students of color. And here now, you know, st students from um, of Middle Eastern dis descent and um, students with um, Asian descent are also under assault, right? And so we have got to be aware of what students are dealing with, the traumas that they are dealing with. So then when we are responding to how they act and react, if we are sensitive, then we can find ways to address behaviors that do not further inflict trauma on students. And, you know, I added this in because I think it's kind of just a very real life example, right? Amanda Gorman, we all recognize her as the poet laureate. She is the one that gave um, the, uh, she read her poem at uh, President Biden's inauguration. He says, a security guard tailed me on my walk home tonight. He demanded if I lived in my building because he said, you look suspicious. I showed my keys and buzzed myself into my building and he left no apology. This is the reality of black girls. One day you're called an icon, the next day a threat. And we can't forget the pandemic. We have kids who are hypervigilant, afraid of this thing that they can't see, but that's having a very real impact on them, on their community, on even their access to education. And now back in the school building and the hypervigilant, oh, someone, effect, and, you know, someone has been infected, we're out for a week, we're back in. Uh, we've got to consider all of these different traumas that our young people are experiencing. And I want you to know that everyone is going to get a copy of this uh, presentation. I'm not going to attempt to read all of these things, but there is an impact and it is going to manifest in the school building. And students with disabilities are, are going to also exhibit behaviors that are truly responses to trauma. And we cannot be quick. We cannot allow our school divisions to be quick to uh, push our students out of the school setting, we've got to make sure that instead we are giving them the opportunity to stay in school, deal with the things that, that are pressing on them in ways that are going to give them more in their toolkit. So adverse childhood experiences, um, adverse childhood experiences, the difference, right, between trauma and an adverse childhood experience that adverse childhood experience is going to happen to someone who is, first of all, zero to 17 years old. Childhood, you know, if we have defined childhood as under 18, then that is the age group, right? And then the negative impact is uh, it's lasting. It continues to uh, reverberate on their health and on their well-being. And this is a list of, but it's not an all-inclusive you know, but nevertheless, these are some of the ways, some of the things that are causing ACEs in our children. And so there are three types of ACEs. There are abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. And an ACE must fit within one of those three categories. It's either abuse, neglect, or household dysfunction. And abuse can be physical, emotional, or sexual. Neglect, physical, or emotional. And in that household dysfunction, uh, so what's going on? Is the child being abused in the home? Um, is there a, perhaps a divorce that's having a, a, a lasting effect? Uh, is there substance abuse? Are there incarcerated parents or has that child or a sibling been impacted by um, incarceration? Mental health. Um, and, and so a mother that's also being um, treated violently, right? So watching a parent being mistreated can have an incredibly negative effect on a child. And so again, what's the difference, right? ACEs, there are 10 different types of adversity or experiences in a child's life in these three categories. And um, these experiences can fit into these clear ACE categories. But each individual child's response to an adversity, may, it may differ, right? 
but trauma is just one potential response to adversity. It's when a child perceives this adversity is extremely harmful or life-threatening. So, you know, to, to, to live in a constant state of, of negative things happening to you, those are ACEs, right, if they fit into one of those 10 categories or uh, one of those 10 experiences. Whereas trauma, it's, this was extremely harmful, whatever this adversity was, extremely harmful or life-threatening or threatening. And so that triggering that fight or flight and kids can stay in that space. So now, trauma, ACEs, and school to prison pipeline, well, how do they correlate, right? How do they interplay on each other? Well, students with three or more ACEs are two and a half times more likely to fail a grade. And students with three or more are significantly more likely to be unable to perform at grade level and be labeled as special education, to be suspended, to be expelled, or to drop out of school. So now thinking back to all of those statistics that I gave you about kids involved in the justice system or being pushed out of school and ending up in the justice system or being pushed directly in and now finding out that students with three or more ACEs and the significant uh, likelihood that they potentially are going to end up either dropping out, being expelled, being labeled as special education, or performing below their grade level. And then stu students not reading proficiently by third grade are four times more likely to fail to graduate from high school. So, we have a convergence now of all of these things, right? We've got kids who are experiencing trauma, experiencing ACEs. It's manifesting in, in these ways that these students aren't able to perform perhaps. And rather than addressing those needs, kids are getting pushed out of school or pushed directly into the justice system. In fiscal year 2020, more than 70% of the youth who were committed to the Department of Juvenile Justice in Virginia were pres prescribed psychotropic medication at some point in their lives. 32.1% have current or newly prescribed psychotropic medications at the time they were admitted. And more than 73% of youth appear to have significant symptoms of a mental health disorder at the time of their admission. And here's the kicker, right? 94.9% .9 of committed youth appear to have significant symptoms of ADHD, conduct disorder, oppositional defiance disorder, or substance use disorder. We have a problem. We have a problem with locking up children with, who have experienced traumas, who are dealing with ACEs, who have, who have some form, who are unfortunately have some form of a disability and none of it has been addressed appropriately before they end up in the justice system and incarcerated. And realize that this group of children that we're talking about here, these are the kids that have gone all the way to the deepest end. These are the kids that are at Bonaire Juvenile Correctional Center. These are the kids who are in uh, CPPs or community placement programs. These are the children that we're talking about here when we say 94.9% .9 of committed youth. This isn't the kid that just ended up in a little bit of trouble and is now on probation. No, no, no. 94.9% .9 of the committed youth, the youth that have gone to the deepest possible end of the justice system, have significant symptoms of one of these uh, disorders. And again, can we, can we revisit what that means? If, if, if Black youth are only 21%, 15 to 17 years, I, I picked, we selected that age group when we did this report because if we are looking at the majority of the young people that find themselves incarcerated, that's that target age number, that's that age group. But if Black youth only make up 21%, but then when we get all the way to the bottom, there's 72% of the young people who are in the custody of DJJ. And then we go back and we understand that 94.9% of all of those young people have one of those disorders or have significant symptoms of, we are locking up children of color with disabilities and we've got to stop it. So, and, and, and so 
you know, I added this slide because I want you all to also understand that even during COVID, when we are releasing more children, uh, fewer kids are getting locked up, but also youth are being released. But by May 2020, detention centers were releasing white youth at a 17% higher rate than black youth. And Virginia is included in this study that was done by Annie Casey. So, again, I have given some, some very stark statistics, right? I mean, lots of bad news, if you will. But where do we go from here? How do we take a trauma-informed approach? We've got to improve education. And, and improving education isn't just making sure that every school is receiving all of the educational resources, although we must do that. But we've got to treat children like children. We've got to get rid of all of the uh, zero tolerance policies and stop referring kids to court for minor offenses. It's awesome that we no longer have disorderly conduct in schools, but we've just got to get into the habit of making sure that, that children are treated as children within the school building and that we are addressing their needs there. Um, and, and, and all of these things, right? Uh, in enforcing laws equitably, regardless of race, and eliminating racial-based policing and incarceration, and then economic equity in every space. Um, taking a trauma-informed approach, it's so critical. And I, I'm going to leave this for you all to see later because I want to get through. I feel like I'm running out of time and there's still so much that I want to um, to cover. But what are the principles of a trauma-informed approach? We're looking for safety, trust, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice, cultural, historical, and gender issues are also considered. So this is basically the blueprint, right? We want to make sure that, yes, we're keeping everyone safe, but we are creating spaces where young people can trust. They can trust every adult. And there, isn't, there aren't things happening that the young people don't find out that are sprung on them later. Young people are given the opportunity to support each other. Uh, there's collaboration and mutuality. We are inviting family in to be a part of the support, right? And we are empowering young people to use their voice and to make their own choices. And it's being done with, with special attention being placed on culture, historical, and gender issues. So 70% of adults have experienced a traumatic event in their lives, according to the National Council of Behavioral Health. So that means that more than 20, 223 million people are living with the effects of trauma. And despite those numbers, there's very little understanding of the importance of the impact of trauma. So what made trauma survivors? What, what does that look like in the school setting? It can look like irritability, refusing to participate, kids wanting to sleep, not being able to focus, difficulty memorizing information, a lack of interest, uh, nervous system on high alert. Again, that, that staying in, fight, fight or flight. And we've got to remember that the vast majority of kids in the juvenile justice system, they're survivors of trauma and they have endured years of toxic stress. So almost everyone who has committed violence has also survived it. So we've got to change the way we look at uh, a problem. Right? So rather than saying someone is defiant, perhaps they're traumatized. Uh, rather than saying someone is non-compliant, perhaps it's a student who is overwhelmed. And uh, instead of saying a student is being disruptive, maybe they're fearful. Maybe they're resisting because they're afraid of what the potential outcome might be. So one of the, one of the, uh, cornerstones of really uh, moving towards trauma-informed and in, in, in the opinion of Rise for Youth is, is looking at restorative practices. And the five key principles of restorative justice is that we focus on the harms and the, con and, and the consequent needed for the victim to feel, uh, as, for the victim as well as the community and the offender. 
but we're ultimately looking to make sure that the person who has experienced the harm can be made whole. Addressing the obligations that arise from a harm that has been committed, using inclusive and collaborative processes, involving those with a legitimate stake in this situation, not just the the um, the person who caused the harm and the person who was harmed, but you know when when a harm is committed in a school setting, there are others who are impacted, and so making sure that those with a legitimate stake can be a part of making sure that. Um, whatever that harm was, that not only is it put right, but that it doesn't happen again. And it's important also to recognize what restorative justice is not. It's not about forgiveness, or primarily it's not about forgiveness and reconciliation. It's not mediation. It's not a program or blueprint. You know, there's not a one-size-fits-all, which is why I prefer to say restorative practices. And it's not primarily intended uh, for comparatively minor offenses or first-time offenders because it's been used across the state, um, across uh, many countries to address all kinds of harms. And it's not new and it's not a North American development. So I wanna play this, uh, this, this uh, short clip for you all and it's going to Describe what exactly is restorative justice. More than half of victims of violent crime don't even call the police in the first place. They prefer nothing to everything we have to offer. The vast majority of crime survivors' pain goes unhealed. What the existence of restorative justice means is that we can no longer pretend we don't know what else to do. But the country, we're really good at punishment. It's passive. It doesn't require people to act, to think. It certainly doesn't require them to change. When we lock people up, we excuse them from their responsibility to answer for what they've done. Restorative justice is a process to hold them accountable. It's a tool. People take turns answering questions like, what happened? What needs arise? Whose responsibility is it to meet those needs? And how is that person going to do it? It requires someone to take responsibility, to repair things as much as possible, and to never commit that harm again. This isn't about feeling sorry. It's about doing sorry. Things like go to school, get a job, pay restitution, apologize, do community service. Restorative justice practices have been used to address low-level infractions like vandalism up to addressing the impact of murders on the surviving family members. Restorative justice processes are first and foremost about meeting the needs of people who are hurt. Sometimes the person who can make the greatest contribution to a survivor's healing is the person who harms them. To come through trauma, we need answers to our questions. To say, my life was never the same after you hurt me like that. Crime survivors want the most safety possibly available. So if incarceration actually produced safety, we would have the safest country in human history. That's not what we have. The core drivers of violence are shame, isolation, and inability to meet one's economic needs and exposure to violence. And we bake those into prisons to try and keep people from committing further violence. Incarceration exposes people to exactly the things that increase the likelihood that they'll go on to harm others. People who are hurt deserve a process that will help them heal. People who are responsible for crime have an obligation to be accountable for that. All of us deserve responses to crime that actually make us safer. Our current criminal justice system doesn't deliver any of those and restorative justice at its best delivers them all. Okay, it's not letting me out. Let me out. <clears throat> there we go. So yeah, restorative justice, 
you know, it, it changes the way we address harm, right? Instead of saying what rule was broken, we then begin to say who was harmed and what harm was done. And instead of asking who broke the rule, what are the needs and the responsibilities of all who are affected? And what punishment is warranted? Instead of asking that question, how do all affected parties address the needs and repair the harm? And so to, if we change the way we even begin to look at harm that has been caused in school, we can change the way then that we are dealing with students who have not just caused harm, but restoring that, that child that has caused the harm, we restore them back, but restoring also that harmed child so that they can coexist in this school, whether they're in the same school or not ultimately, but making sure that everyone is restored back to the learning environment, that there isn't such a break that all of a sudden one child is just excluded. We're telling that child, no longer do you fit within the learning community. We have, we have decided that your access to education is no longer valid because of a harm, because of a mistake, because of you know, something that you have done. That's the wrong message to send to children. Um, these are more examples of uh, the difference between a punitive versus a restorative response. And you know, I, I just want to uh, provide several uh, resources so that um, we can really understand restorative justice as or restorative practices as an option and move in that direction. Because key findings from restorative justice in schools research, most respondents agreed that student discussion circles are the most frequently used component and that uh, respondents indicated that one of the biggest successes of implementing a restorative justice approach is a large and a rapid decrease in student suspensions and expulsions. Can I read that again? One of the greatest, one of the biggest successes of implementing restorative justice is a large and rapid, large and rapid decrease in student suspension and expulsion. And some of the most common challenges include resistance from administration, staff, students, and parents, uh, insufficient funding, and extensive training uh, requirements. So if we want to make a commitment to making sure that we have something that has large and rapid, that produces a large and rapid decrease in student suspension and expulsion, we need to make sure that we are making sure that it's funded getting buy-in from the administration, staff, and students. You know, when we go back to the core um, values and we remember that when we want to use restorative or trauma-informed practices, that uh, creating a, a trusting environment, a collaborative environment, those key principles, if we create that environment, then restorative justice becomes something that students feel like they can participate in. Uh, administrations feel that they must provide. Staff and parents, uh, they also come to the table ready to be a part of something that they were also in the, in, in the process of building. And so that's restorative justice and one of the, the, the foundational uh, ways in which we believe we can indeed move beyond pushing kids out of school. But we can do more than that, right? What can you do beyond the school building? You know, Virginians back a range of justice reform, right? And you know, they, in, they back in Virginians at 81% back increased spending on social workers and mental health counselors in school. You know, all of these are ways in which Virginians are ready to proactively move towards pushing kids out of school. Design treatments and rehabilitation plans that include a youth family in planning and services. Increased spending on youth rehabilitation. All of these are things that we need. And when we apply this to the school setting, we can stop pushing kids out. And we, when we recognize that so many of our young people, uh, it, it, young people with disabilities are experiencing so many things in this time, right? Trauma is a very real thing right now with the pandemic and with other things that are happening, we have got to make sure that what we're providing to young people is the opportunity to be successful 
one of the best ways to do that is to make sure that every resource is used to, to make restorative practices available and to stop pushing kids out, whether it's restorative practices or not. To stop pushing kids out of school and begin to do things that are going to cause kids to be successful in the learning environment. Let's keep kids in school. And I'd also like to invite you all to take legislative action, right? Uh, Rise for Youth, our legislative priorities, you know, we want to see the Department of Juvenile Justice housed under the Secretary of Public health and human resources rather than where it is now in the uh, Secretary of Public Safety and Homeland Security. We should not be looking at our children as as a threat, a terrorist threat, right? Isn't that what Homeland Security is all about? And every other child serving agency in the Commonwealth is housed under the Public Health and Human Resources Secretariat. So why wouldn't we place the agency that is that is tasked with providing the greatest support to young people. Why wouldn't we place it where every other child serving agency is? I had the, the pleasure of presenting to the Advisory Council on Juvenile Justice Programming, and I shared with them this particular uh, legislative priority. And some of the agencies were there and they were like, you know, it would make collaboration so much easier. Because right now, whenever the Department of Juvenile Justice is in need of some of our services, it's difficult because we're under different secretaries. And so I, I hope you will all join in the fight to move the Department of Juvenile Justice because we, we want to make sure that we keep kids in school, but those that, that aren't, those that are not successful, those that end up in the system, we've got to make sure that we are providing the greatest opportunity for them to be successful as well. Um, we are also looking to uh, eliminate, uh, it, let's see, eliminate all fines and fees associated to uh, associated with youth in the juvenile justice system. I wonder how many of you recognize that or, or are aware that it costs more to end up in court in poor and community of color, uh, a, a under-resourced community and a community of color than it does than in a more affluent community. So when you go to the more impoverished uh, areas of Virginia, it costs more to go to court. Isn't that something? That we have allowed our system to be so biased in the way that it treats individuals, that it literally, folks are charged more. And then when we look at the kids who end up in the justice system, Disproportionately, they again are coming from communities that are uh, lacking in economic mobility. You know, there uh, th there are so many lacks in the communities that um, incarcerate the most youth, and then to find out that it also costs more for those families. Then we need to get rid of that system of charging folks uh, for their justice system involvement, and 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 begin to deal equitably with every child. Um, we also want to extend, expand the use of credible messengers into schools because these are individuals who have uh, made their, they have made mistakes and found their way back to their communities and are ready to give back. We need to make sure that we are using every resource available to us to support young people. Um, others that I think are really important, uh, prohibit police from lying to youth during interrogation. We want to eliminate that practice um, and then require youth be provided legal counsel before they are interrogated. Those are, those are, those are pieces of legislation that um, I'm hoping that, I hope you'll support us in all of them, but these are particular pieces that can have a positive impact on, on young people as they are uh, finding their way through a system, but hopefully we'll be able to keep them out of the system altogether. So I would like to thank you all for granting me this opportunity to share. And now I would love to um, entertain any questions. Valerie, there were a couple um, comments in the chat as you were going along. 
um, if you want to take a look at those while people um, yeah. kind of come up, come up with some questions. Um, I know uh, Jason Gray mentioned um, when you were talking about, you know, some some of the solutions, maybe SRO training. Um, so I'm not sure if you have any specific thoughts or comments on that. Um, so SRO training, you know, that's a mixed bag for me. It's a mixed bag because um, we've been talking about SRO training now for a few years. And, you know, in some localities, it is yielding a positive result. Um, but unfortunately, in some areas, it it is not having the effect that we had hoped. Um, it's actually our hope that we will, um, along with training, that we will begin to give some of the responsibilities that have landed on SROs back to the school division with the support of community partners that want to come in and be supports for schools. And that lends itself directly to credible messengers that I was just talking about. Credible messengers are trusted by young people. They're respected by young people. And, and I'm talking specifically in the communities that have the highest uh, incident of, uh, of, of police involvement in the school. And that's not just SROs that are patrolling hallways and making sure that criminal behavior isn't happening, but that SROs that are also being asked to be, um, oh, be the coach and be the mentor and to be all of these things. But when you go into more affluent communities, that's not the case, right? We have community members that are coming in and supporting. And if we recognize that there are challenges unique to some communities, then we meet those challenges with those best suited to address them, right? And so if indeed it is a high crime community, right? It, 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 it's, a crime, it's a community with a high incidence of crime. And that is not uh, it is in no way to disparage a particular community, it is to recognize just the reality of that community. Then you want to look to the credible messengers, those who have found themselves tangled in the system, have gone perhaps even away to prison, but now are back and have rehabilitated their lives and are wanting to expend their resources, their time, their energy to support young people to keep them out of trouble, to keep them from going down those same paths. Why would we block them from coming in, providing that support? I'm gonna tell you, when we are out in the community working in some of the uh, communities that we serve, because we do indeed target the communities with the highest incidence of crime. We absolutely do. But when we are out, we are talking to the young folks and, you know, and we have credible messengers that are working with us and the respect is real. And so if we know what these individuals have to offer, why, we, why would we not use that resource when it can yield such a positive result? And our hope is that uh, credible messengers would receive uh, paraeducator training so that they can be in a classroom and help and support, that they are receiving even the same training that the um, residential uh, persons at Bon Air would receive so that they know how to de-escalate situations and know how to interact and that they would also receive restorative practices training. And so now you've got this individual with all of these key trainings who is able to be a liaison if necessary to a child accessing that, uh, that social worker or that counselor. Because in particular communities, in some communities, that counselor isn't looked at as that trusted individual. You don't know my life. You don't know my story. You're somebody who, you know, you went to your college and now here you are with your do-gooder hat on thinking you're going to have an impact on my life. And so kids are just pushing them away before they even have an opportunity to find out what potentially they have to offer. Imagine that we have these liaisons that are able to create a pathway to that extra resource that some youth are not accessing at this point. So we believe that we need to reduce the reliance on school resource officers. Allow them to keep schools safe. That's what they are hired to do, right? That's what they're brought into the school environment to do. But does that have to mean as much as we have put on their plate right now? We say we think not. 
It's time to roll back some of those responsibilities, give them to community members, give them to others who are willing to support, who have been trained and who have the expertise that even, it, there are few that have the expertise that, a, that a, um, a credible messenger would as it relates to the challenges of community, the, the things that youth are facing and how to help them walk it back to a positive place. And so um, that's, gosh, kind of a winded answer, but what, how we feel about school resource officers and the reliance on them. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, I, I am looking at the statement. I believe this is from, uh, let me see, I can't, let me see. Yes, Jason Gray, numerous JLARC reports, identified deficiencies and over referral to DDJ. You're absolutely right. And the Department of Juvenile Justice right now is under study. I hope y'all know. Jay Lark is studying the Department of Juvenile Justice right now. And if you go to their website, there is a survey that any, any family that has a young person that has been involved with the, the uh, DJJ from just being referred to a CSU, a court services unit, um, to, to all the way up to being incarcerated, but anywhere along that spectrum, any family that has had any involvement, they're asking for your input. They need to hear from you because the worst thing possible as they are doing this study is for the agency to uh, reflect on itself. We need the community that has had involvement to be the loudest voice to talk about what that involvement has been like for them. And so, I encourage you, uh, for each of you that may know someone, please get the link to that study, send it. Have the family members, have the young folks that have been involved, have them all take the study so that indeed it will be a thorough review of the system and not just, again, like I said, the agency reviewing itself. Um, and, and, and again, you're right. Uh, the worst at, it, it, you know, Virginia was the worst at referring students uh, with disabilities. And you're right, it also continues. But how do we stop it? That means that we're going to have to get engaged. We're going to have to be looking at every space that uh, any way, just like taking this survey, that you are able to, uh, being a part of the advocacy that's going to happen uh, for the 2022 session. Also, you know, all the be a part of your uh, your school. Know what's going on in your school. If you know of particular policies or practices that are happening that are not effective, did you know that you, anyone, can put forward um, a changed policy for your school board? Did you know that? Anyone can do it. I would suggest that you do a little research and understand the, you know, who the players are and, you know, don't step on anyone's toes. But nevertheless, get other concerned parents together and whether those are parents that have students who have disabilities or not, I would encourage you to gather all of the parents, right? As many as are willing to be a part of making sure that every student is treated appropriately in school, that's who should be a part of who you are networking with to make change happen. You're running it by all of these parents to make sure, you know what? I saw this particular policy and I know in practice it's having this negative effect. I was thinking about submitting an amendment to this particular policy, but I wanted to run it by a few folks so that I could hear feedback on how it potentially would impact. What would be the impact of this change before you submit it? Do you have trusted members of the school board that would be willing to be a part of that process? You know, those that are sympathetic to positive change and making sure that equity, equity rules the day. Those are the folks that you want to make sure are taking a look at what you potentially are going to put forward because ultimately power is either money or people. And when people in mass are moving as one, it can be even more powerful than money as it relates to what we're talking about today. So remember that, please always remember power. It's people and it's money amass as many as you can to make the change that you need. And I would encourage you to reach out to me as well because I'm always down to help make positive change happen. Um, I kind of got stuck there. Let's see, I'm gonna go to the bottom now. 
Yeah, definitely more funding is needed, April. Um, yeah. Valerie, I think there was a, um, a question above. Um, what suggestions do you have for increasing buy-in, particularly school administrators? You know, I am hopeful that much of the information that I shared on restorative justice, you know, there's a whole report. I put a picture of the report and the link to it. I encourage you, study it first. Know the information yourself first, but then begin to share it. Offer it as, huh, you know, and, and administrations tend to not want to hear you coming in telling them what they need to do, but making suggestions and offering uh, insights that, were nationally recognized, right? And then offering yourself for conversation to consider these things. And then as a group of parents, rather than as individual parents, to demonstrate that, you know what, buy-in is already happening from those that are most impacted by this thing. You know, so um, again, strategy, strategy, strategy is key, right? And when you arm yourself with information, when you arm yourself with what the output of a particular district are right now when they're in their negative state. And then you are able to, to show, but here is this new, this it, not even new, right? But here is this option available to us that is yielding such positive. What was it? Large and continual uh, positive support or, or positive outcomes, right? The reduction of suspensions and expulsions. Wow. You know, when you're able to bring that kind of uh, result to address a problem that is happening across our nation, I mean, it's kind of hard to, to say no to that. It's kind of hard to say no to the conversation. And, you know, we are working to kind of get some of these things codified. Not that every school division has got to use restorative practices, but looking for the ways to ensure that the, the, the least what is available is the least amount is um, is punitive in nature towards children. We have got to reduce punitive reactions to children. And if we and if we've already recognized that in the war, you know, in the juvenile justice system, why can't we get there in schools? We must get there in schools. Um, and maybe you're reading these quicker than I am, Jesse. So if so, please jump in. Um, no, not at all. I think um, Angela's right here at the bottom. Um, mm. What? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what I don't want to see is an option or solution alternative to suspension or expulsion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, school systems say, okay, I won't kick them out, but I'll keep them in a secluded or restraint room. Wow. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, and so what's really needed is, and we've uh, unsuccessfully been advocating for, but we have got to get, you know, uh, standards for the use of and, and actually the elimination of seclusion and restraint. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still reading here. Exclusion restraint is part of the school to prison pipeline conversation. Exclusion restraint caused trauma as well. Is it being recognized? Yes. Okay. I, I just finished reading um, what you shared. Yes. Uh, seclusion and restraint are being recognized. Um, but unfortunately, until we can get to a place where we, the advocates and the parents, when we aren't the only ones that are recognizing and ready to move in positive directions away from just uh, carving out when we can versus getting rid of, right? We have really got to get to a place where it's just not okay to seclude a child. You don't have that timeout room where you're, you know, and you're going to put a child in that space. We've got to get to that place. But the only way we're going to get there, again, is when we in NAF are saying this is unacceptable. Um, every time I read the next iteration of oh, you know, these are the policies around the use of, I groan inside because what that basically means is we're going to keep on 
Um, and, you know, and ultimately we've created these loopholes for us to continue to use something that is causing harm to kids is what that is what I hear when I read the new iteration. And so, um, again, I, like I said, my contact information is on the slide, and I'm hoping that you will reach out if you are indeed moving in the direction to uh, end the use of seclusion and restraint. Rise for Youth wants to be on board and, make it, and helping to make that happen. Um, Awesome. I think we have just just one more minute here, um, but I just put your contact information in the chat for everyone's um, ease of access. Um, and like Valerie said, uh, this PowerPoint will be um, provided if uh, if you all need it. And it looks like Jason's put um, uh, some information in the chat as well about ACEs. Awesome. Awesome. Well, again, thank you all so much for having me. Um, I have enjoyed sharing this information with you, and I hope you will reach out to me so that we together can fight and, and make positive change happen for all of our students. Thank you so much, Valerie. We really appreciate this um, really helpful and important conversation that you led us through today. Um, here, I uh, mentioned this in the chat, but um, she uh, says kind of next up would be to get a snack, take a break um, and mingle with exhibitors until the next session, which starts at 2.45. So thank you again, um, everyone for attending and thank you, Valerie.